أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على قم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المبلومين المنتجبين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولاستق القائنين عوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى على محمد وآل محمد The holy month of Shah Ramadan is of course the most important days and the most important month in the Islamic calendar. And it is the month of reform, it is the month of re- reformation, it is the month of change, it is the month of the revolution of our hearts and of our souls. And during this month we see that change takes place on a number of different phases. The first dimension of change that takes place during this blessed month is the change of our bodies. Naturally, when you have to fast for 16 hours, for 30 consecutive days, your body is going to change physically. Depending on the food that we eat, the nights and the days, they become very difficult for us. But we see that narrations of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu was salam, they stress that the month of Ramadan should be a month which changes our bodies physically for the better. The hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, it states, Sumu tasuhu, that fast and you will become healthy. Thus, during the month of Ramadan, in reality, we should be intaking a lot less, not intaking the amount that we would normally eat in the last seven or eight hours when the sun has set. So let's we go, come forth and we see that the first aspect of reformation during the holy month of Ramadan is bodily, physical change that inshallah will improve our health. And secondly, and of course most importantly, the dimension of spiritual change, the change of our hearts, and the change of our souls during this blessed month of Shah Ramadan. The aspiration, the goal, is that our hearts are to be presented toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with absolute purity at the culmination of these 30 days of the blessed month of Ramadan. And when we take a look at this particular aspect of the human heart, we see that the whole of Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the Qur'an in terms of three different types. The first type of heart that he mentions, and when he mentions heart within the Qur'an, or when the heart is mentioned within Ahl al-Bayt, the, 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 the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt, we're not speaking about the physical heart, but we're speaking about the spiritual heart. We see that the spiritual heart is in three different phases. The first phase is what is known as qalbun salim. Illa man atallaha biqalbin salim. The verse in the whole Qur'an, it states that your children and that your wealth are going to be no use for you on the Day of Judgment. The only thing that is going to be useful for you is the pure heart. Man atallah the qalbin salim. The second type of heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions within the whole Qur'an is known as the sick heart. He mentions several times, fi qulubihim maradun fazadahum Allahu maradah. That for these disbelievers who are constantly rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts are sick. And when they continue to transgress, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compounds that sickness and compounds that disease within their heart. The third type of heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions within the whole Quran is what is known as qulubun qasiyah, or what is known as a hard heart. These three levels. The first level is the is the healthy, the pure, the clean heart. The second level is the sick heart that has been inflicted by disease due to sin. And the third heart is what is known as qulubun qasiyah, 
meaning the hard heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that those individuals who are constantly forgetful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the days and in the nights and after years and years of living on God's earth, they completely are forgetful of Him. They have what is known as this hard heart. Now to put this all in perspective before we get into our discussion. The first type of heart is that which we need to aspire to be. That which we need to aspire to have. The heart that is pure, the heart that is clean, the heart that has been purified is able to then be receptive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's teachings, the teachings of the Qur'an, the teachings of the Prophet, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. See the heart like a sponge. If the sponge is, 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 is receptive, if the sponge is pure, if the sponge is clean, if the sponge is new, it's able to be receptive to water, it's able to be receptive to liquids. But after that heart has been abused, after the body has continuously transgressed the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like that sponge, it becomes dirty. And it slowly it begins to gain these qualities of sickness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and in their hearts is a sickness. We see that that sick heart is not able to be receptive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way that the clean, pure heart would have been able to be. And thirdly and finally is what is known as قلوب قاسية, that hard heart. Like the sponge when the sponge is hard after it's been used for an extremely long time and there's no liquid on it, we know that it's extremely difficult to break. It's extremely difficult to squeeze. Similarly is the heart when it has transgressed the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that no longer does it even reflect or think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the least bit. We need to desire to become amongst those who have this clean heart. Now to put this in perspective a little bit further, in order to understand the importance of having this clean heart, we go ahead and we see that the side effects of having a heart that has been inflicted by disease are two. The first one of these on one level is that we begin to doubt in the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or even worse, we begin to doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entirely. When an individual has constantly transgressed the boundaries of Allah and left that state of the purity of the heart and went toward the stages of sickness of the heart or went to the stage even worse of hard-heartedness, we come forth and we see that the human being, he begins to doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're all sitting over here fasting during the holy month of Ramadan. We're very exhausted. None of us would ever come forth and state that I am doubting in the authority or in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't do that, alhamdulillah. But there's something that is connected to this doubt. And that is not only doubting in the presence of Allah, but perhaps we begin after constant transgression and sin to begin to doubt in the names and in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, one group of people, they come and they step forth, and they state that I doubt if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look how much I've sinned, there is no way He's ever going to forgive me. The minute that someone begins to talk like this, they have despaired in the all-powerful and the all-merciful Lord who has created us. And this is a sign of doubting in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself. Very dangerous. And less dangerous than that, perhaps, is doubting in the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who states, they begin to reflect, and they tell themselves, you know what, if I eat a little bit, or if I drink a little bit during the holy month of Ramadan, is Allah really going to punish me? We don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the authority, and when He has told us to do something, we should be willing to submit toward that immediately. That is what it means to truly understand the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the minute that we see ourselves even having these thoughts enter into our mind, Allah will never forgive me if I do this sin. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive me because I'm such a sinner. Or on the flip side that we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He won't punish me because these are only small sins. That these are signs of having the disease of the heart present between our two shoulders. This is on one level in terms of the symptoms of the disease the heart. On a greater level, on a more dangerous, on a more worrisome level, we come forth and we see that individuals, they begin to completely reject the tawheed 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entirely. Not only doubting, but they state we don't believe in God. Again, when we come and reflect on that in terms of our hearts, in terms of our souls, we state, you know what? We all believe in God. We pray and we fast and we do all of the obligatory actions and we stay away from the haram. At least we do our best to do so. So thankfully, we're not amongst those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, alhamdulillah, we have not reached that level. But this particular aspect of rejecting the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't only mean rejecting God in terms of its essence or in terms of his names or in terms of his attributes, but it begins by completely rejecting certain obligations in terms of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion of Islam is known as the religion of Islam because the word Islam means submission. Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al-Balagha, he states, Al-Islam huwa taslim. The religion of Islam is the religion of submission. Submission toward God, submission toward the Qur'an, submission toward the Prophet, submission toward the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wasalam, that is what makes us a believer. And I say all of this as an introduction toward getting to my topic of discussion. And that is that when we come to reflect upon our hearts and in our souls, we need to understand that this month of Shah Ramadan is the month that we remove all of these sicknesses. We remove this heart heartedness from our hearts and we begin to focus ourselves, directing ourselves toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we present ourselves toward God with that purified, with, with that purified heart. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ But the question is, how do we become amongst those who cleanse our hearts and cleanse our souls and able to maximize the benefits within this blessed month? And a narration from Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al Baqar, alayhi salatu was salam. He states, Likulli shay in Rabi, wa Rabi al Quran, Shahru Ramadan. That for everything, that, that, that for every season, that for everything there's a spring, there is a, there's a climax to every period or for every concept. And the climax of the Qur'an or the spring of the Qur'an is the holy month of Ramadan. That when the believer, we strive our best to link our hearts and to link our souls with the whole Qur'an, then we are able to maximize that benefit and the blessing of this blessed month. I know that today is the first day of the fast and I know that everyone is exhausted including myself. But if you're following or to give me a little bit of a break, please recite one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That during this holy month of Ramadan, we need to make sure that we maximize our potentials with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to make sure that number one, we do not procrastinate when it comes to the recitation of the whole Quran. One day is about to pass us. Within 35 minutes or so, we will begin to break our fast and the first day of the month of Ramadan has concluded. How many of us recited the verses of the Qur'an today? How many of us contemplated on the verses of the Holy Qur'an today? We come forth and we see numerous traditions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ emphasize the importance of the recitation of the Holy Qur'an. We go ahead and we see a narration from the Holy Prophet. He states, Ekthiru. Constantly increase within this holy month the recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we go forth and we see that in the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the reason why we should be reciting it. He states, Shifa'un lima fasudur. That the whole Quran is a cure for that which is within your chests. Meaning, it is a cure for those diseases which are in your heart. In order to cleanse our hearts from all of these diseases, we need to constantly be in recitation of the Holy Quran. In another narration from the Holy Prophet, he states, وَمَنْ تَلَا فِيهِ آيَةٌ مِّنَ الْقُرْآنِ كَانَ لَهُ مِثْلُ عَجْرِ مَنْ خَتَمَ الْقُرْآنِ فِي غَيْرِهِ مِنَ الشُّهُورِ The Holy Prophet states that the one who recites one verse from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within this holy month, it is as if he has completed the entirety of the Qur'an within other months. Meaning that the reward for reciting one verse in the month of Ramadan is like reciting the entire Qur'an in other months. 
we come forth and we see another narration from the Holy Prophet and the most important one he recites in this sermon of his on the last day of the, Sha- on the, last day of the month of Sha'ban toward his companions. He states, Make sure that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for two things within this holy month. That you ask Him for tawfiq. Tawfiq means divine intervention, divine help. That you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His divine help so that you can fast within this month and so that you can recite the whole Qur'an. Meaning that, my dear brothers and sisters, that reciting the whole Qur'an within this holy month, like fasting within this holy month, requires divine help. That if we see ourselves, for instance, the first day of the month of Ramadan passing, the second day, the third day, one week, the month, the, 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 the night of Laylatul Qadr comes, and then we begin to recite the whole Qur'an, we have to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed tawfiq from us. He removed His divine blessing and His divine intervention from us if we see ourselves failing to recite the whole Qur'an. Thus the Holy Prophet, he states within this narration, rabbukum sadaq. Ask Allah with a clean intention. وَقُلُوبٍ طَاهِرَ And a pure heart, that He blesses you and that He allows you and that He facilitates for you to recite the whole Qur'an within these days and within these nights of the holy month of Shah Ramadan. We come forth and we see that reciting the whole Qur'an is not sufficient. But we have to take it to the next level and contemplate upon these verses, upon the ayat of the books, uh, upon the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For who is amongst the most famous reciters of the whole Quran within history? Amongst the most famous reciters of the whole Quran is a man by the name of Ibn Muljim, the killer of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam, the man who struck Amir al Mu'mineen on the 19th of this blessed month, was known to be a memorizer of the Quran. He would recite Qur'an day and night, along with the other khawarij. Amongst those who are amongst the memorizers of the whole Qur'an is a man by the name of Shimr bin al Joshan, The killer of Aba Abdullah al Hussein on the day of Ashura was amongst those who recited the Qur'an. He was, he was amongst those who memorized the Qur'an. But unfortunately, their hearts were not cleansed. Their hearts had not, really, had not reached that level of qalbun salim, but rather they had heart-heartedness where you come forth and you see that they fail to be receptive to that which is present within the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we read the whole Qur'an like any other book, without understanding the instruction that comes from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're no better than them. We need to make sure that we take ourselves to the next level in terms of being amongst those who contemplate upon the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who contemplate upon the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When we want to go ahead and reflect upon the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within these days, within these nights of the holy month of Ramadan, we need to understand that there are certain etiquettes in terms of recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There, and these etiquettes, they are formed into ter- in terms of two different dimensions. The first dimension are those physical etiquettes in terms of our, of our dealing with the physical book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the whole Qur'an. And the second are what are known as those internal etiquettes that we have to do in terms of dealing with the whole Qur'an. In terms of the physical, there are several. Before we recite the whole Qur'an, we should be in the state of wudu. How many of us came to the mosque today in the state of wudu in preparation to recite the whole Qur'an? Someone who comes forth and states, that I will recite the whole Qur'an, but I won't touch the verses. I won't touch the letters. So there's no need for me to be in the state of wudu. Yes, that's true. It's not wajib for you to be in the state of wudu in terms of reciting the holy book. But that's not the point. The point is to allow our hearts to reach the next level. So thus, in the very basic level, there's no harm in performing the wudu and then coming to reciting the holy Qur'an. A second thing that we should try our best to do whenever we can, and there's nothing wrong for us to not do it, but we should try our best, especially when we're in solitude, to face the qibla when reciting the whole Qur'an. Facing the qibla, nothing wrong with that either. Someone might state, there's no, 
mustahabbat uh, in terms of facing the qibla when we're reciting the whole thing. That's not the point again. The point is that we need to do our best when we're facing the qibla to recognize that we are facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's home. We're facing Mecca. We're facing the Holy Kaaba. And my recitation of the Holy Quran in that state has a little bit more potential for me to connect with Him. There's nothing wrong with that. Again. Number three, that when we come forth to reciting the whole Qur'an, after performing the wudu, after preparing ourselves, facing the qibla, take the whole Qur'an and kiss the book. When we're concluding our recitation, kiss the whole Qur'an. When we're reciting the whole Qur'an itself, take your finger and touch the verses. These are all blessings, these are all barakah that we can attain from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a famous story narrated by Shaykh al-Kulayni. Who is Shaykh al-Kulayni? Shaykh al-Kulayni is the compiler of Kitab al-Kafi, one of the most important books of ahadith that we have within the school of Ahlul Bayt, narrations of the Holy Prophet, narrations of the imams of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhimu salatu wasalam. And it said that one day Shaykh al-Kulayni was not feeling well. He had an intense eye pain. He was reading, his job is to read and to research and to write. And this particular day, this intense eye pain was extremely crucial in terms of hindering him from doing exactly what he wanted to do. So he looks toward his son and he says, Oh son, go toward the doctor, go toward the pharmacist and get me some medicine so I can remove this pain from my eye. This, it's giving me a headache and I'm unable to work, I'm, un, 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 I'm unable to read and research and so on and so forth. It is said a couple of moments later, or excuse me, this is narrated on behalf of Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi, the, the compiler of Mafatih al jinan this most important book of A'mal and Dua that we have. The son goes out toward the doctor, to the pharmacist, whatever. After an hour or so later, he returns back home. And he sees his father sitting on the table, reading and writing and researching, and resuming his activities as normal. He says, Dad, I didn't even give you any medicine. What happened? He says, I realized after you left that I don't need any medicine. For I have the book of Sheikh Al-Kulayni, the book of Al-Kafi, the ahadith and the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam. He says, what do you mean? He says, I went to my library and I picked up that book and I recited Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Oh Allah, I ask you by the words of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam to cure this pain in my head, to cure this pain in my eye. And I took the book of Al-Kafi and I rubbed it on my head and I saw a few moments later that I had been cured from my sickness. How about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we recite the whole Qur'an, the whole Qur'an is not only a cure for our spiritual diseases, but perhaps it's a cure for our physical diseases if we actually believe that it is. That's the hard part. To allow ourselves to reach this level, our hearts and our souls, to reach this level of elevation, for us to have this itmi'nan, for us to have the certainty that the whole Qur'an is a means for us to actually cure ourselves. Thus amongst those etiquettes of the recitation of the whole Qur'an, as we were mentioning, is to make sure that we touch the holy verses, that we take blessing from it by kissing the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we rub our fingers upon those verses. Amongst the etiquette of the recitation of the holy Qur'an is to make sure that we recite the holy Qur'an in a loud voice. Not in a loud voice that is too loud that it distracts others, but not completely silent that we are only moving our mouth, or we're only moving our lip without actually making a sound, because that's not recitation. The reward comes in terms of re reciting the whole Qur'an. And in fact, we see that reward is in many different phases when it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a reward for looking at the verses of the Qur'an. There is a reward for reciting the verses of the whole Qur'an. There is a reward for hearing when you're driving to work, coming back from work to the mosque during these holy month of Ramadan. Listen to the, listen, listen to the recording of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is all means and ways to build this link between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amongst the etiquette of the recitation of the whole Qur'an, for instance, is to make sure that when we're reciting, we actually look at the words, that we're actually looking at the verses. Not for memorization, that every single day before you sleep, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you recite three times Surah Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, and you say, I've recited the Qur'an today, my responsibility is done. No, reciting the Qur'an by looking at the verses, these are a means again, to make sure that we are fulfilling our, or, or, or that, we, that we are fulfilling our right toward the whole Quran. This, these are all in terms of physical, natural etiquettes that we can go ahead and perform. They are not difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. 
But the more important level in terms of fulfilling our etiquette toward the whole Qur'an is in terms of those internal or in terms of those spiritual etiquettes. The first of those spiritual etiquettes is to make sure that we are taking lessons from the Qur'an at every single moment. Many of us during the holy month of Ramadan, we do our very best to complete the khatam. We try to complete the Qur'an two times or three times. That's very good. There's no, nothing wrong with that. It's very highly encouraged. But for someone to make sure that they complete the Qur'an a billion times within this month without ever understanding exactly what you recited, what's the point? What makes us better than Ibn Muslim? What makes us better than Shem? We need to make sure that we take our hearts and our souls toward the next level to make sure that we are understanding exactly what we are doing in terms of the recitation of the whole of Qur'an. On a second level and most importantly, we need to be contemplating those verses that we are reciting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do you not contemplate the whole of Qur'an or upon your heart is there a lock? Again, going back toward the heart. Contemplating the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the potential to remove that disease, have the potential to remove this lock that is on our heart. How do we contemplate? When we're reciting or when we're reading the story of Musa or Isa or Yusuf or Ya'qub or any of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine for a moment that we are living within that particular historical period. When we're reciting the verses of the punishment of Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that for the disbelievers, He is going to give X punishment or Y punishment or, e or, or Z punishment, at that moment, reflect in terms of what it would be to be living and receiving that torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, oh Allah, save me from this. And on the flip side, when you're, when you're reciting the verses of reward and of bounty and of paradise, say, oh Allah, make me from amongst those who are receiving this. These are all methods in terms of increasing our relationship and at the same time doing our best to contemplate upon those verses that we are reciting during this holy month of Ramadan. In the same way that if we were to take Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the story of Karbara and the story of Ashura and segregate it to only one historical period that took place on the 10th of Muharram, 61 years after Hijra, and see Hussein as a historical figure, then we haven't done much in terms of understanding the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Thus, what we need to do again is to make sure that we are living, we are living through the verses that we are reciting, that we are imagining ourselves to be in that situation, and that is the way to maximize our potential, to maximize our reward, to maximize our relationship within this blessed month, with the holy month of Ramadan. And beginning tomorrow night, inshallah, we will begin our discussion on chapter, on, on, on one of the most important chapters within the whole of Quran, what is known as Surat Nuh. Surat Nuh is a chapter within the whole of Quran that allows us to extract numerous different lessons. The first one of these lessons that we can understand, inshallah, we'll focus on this particular aspect tomorrow night. The first lesson that we need to understand from this particular chapter of the whole of Quran is in terms of how to remain faithful in the midst of all different types of struggles that we encounter within our life. Prophet Nuh السلام, according to narrations, he pre according to the whole of the Quran, he preaches for 950 years. 950 years, but he doesn't get phased from only having mo at most 800 followers. That's less than one follower per year. The Prophet Nuh السلام, remains patient. He remains focused in terms of constantly working to get closer toward preaching the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, we begin to reflect in terms of what it means to build our heart toward that level in terms of being receptive toward the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of being responsive and receptive toward the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We take lessons from chapter Nuh, from, from, from Surah Nuh within these next couple of nights. I'll, con I'll, con I'll conclude with this final du'a. And my dear brothers and sisters, we need to understand and recognize one thing when it comes toward the whole Qur'an. And that is that we are unable to understand the depths of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a teacher. And that teacher of ours is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salatu wa salam. <coughs> that during this holy month, many people, they come to me for instance, and they said, I was reciting this verse and I was reciting this chapter and I was reciting this and that. 
And all of a sudden, I've got it all figured out. I understand the religion of Islam from beginning to end upon my basic recitation of the whole Qur'an. Well, if you recite the whole Qur'an and completely segregate it and completely marginalize it from the holy household of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam, then you have not understood. Then you have not understood the first thing of the whole Qur'an, because the Prophet he states in Nitarik fiqum at taqalain, Kitab Allah wa itrati ahlu bayti. That I have left behind for you two things. The first of these is the whole Qur'an, and the second of these is the Ahlul Bayt That each one of these they explain the other. The Qur'an explains Ahlul Bayt, and Ahlul Bayt they explain the Qur'an. Thus we need to make sure that we utilize the narrations of Ahlul Bayt that we go back toward the teachings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states within the whole Quran, La yamussuhu illa al mutahharun That no one can touch the holy book except for those who are purified. On one level this speaks about physical purification, that no one should be touching the Quran if they haven't performed wudu or if they haven't performed the ghusl. But on a second level, it is in terms of those who have, who, who have reached the purification of the heart. And who are those individuals? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْحِبَ أَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَحِرَكُمْ تَطْحِيرًا That those who are purified, of course, are the household of the Holy Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt And thus no one can touch the Qur'an, meaning that no one can delve into the depths of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for the Ahlul Bayt Thus we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Within these nights, every single night, we should make sure that we make this du'a, that we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the Imam, for he is the one who is the interpreter of the whole Qur'an within this age. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the Imam, so he comes toward us and explains toward, toward us and presents toward us the depths of the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us the tawfiq to become amongst the reciters, to become amongst the readers, to become amongst those who contemplate the Holy Qur'an. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sadillahumma ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa alihat tayyibin.